Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, offer a land acknowledgement before we begin. Western Arts Alliance stands in solidarity with indigenous peoples and is based respectfully in the now occupied traditional lands of the bands of Chinook, the Multnomah, the Clathlamet, the Clackamas, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and the Malala tribes. Um, this place where we now live in Portland is, is at the confluence of two great rivers. So many native nations kind of made their home here and, and, and came here to trade. So it's really a center and remains a center for indigenous cultures throughout the area. Um, before we begin, just a couple of notes. Uh, of course, I'm Tim Wilson, Executive Director of Western Arts Alliance. And I wanna sort of thank you all for joining us this morning. And wanna put a plug in for tomorrow's panel. Same time, same station. Uh, working in a polarized community, which I think is going to be a very important conversation, sort of giving all the kind of the ways that our society is dividing uh, across many um, um, elements of, of, of American and North American society around free speech, racial justice, health, environment, and so on. Uh, this is an important conversation that really brings some of that social division kind of right uh, to the edges of our own stages and venues. Uh, we have a fantastic panel with Camille Beregar, uh, Dr. Teresa Martinez, who's a sociologist from the University of Utah, Dr. Iquail Shahid, who is a dance maker and a professor of dance in Philadelphia. And it's gonna be moderated by uh, Tony uh, Gomez uh, from Tacoma Arts Live and from the Law Board. So uh, check out that panel tomorrow at 10 Pacific time. And speaking of moderators, I am delighted to introduce Karen Elizondo from Spectrix, uh, and Spectrum has, has been a great supporter of WA, and we're delighted to have Karen here today to moderate um, this panel. Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Tim. I appreciate it. And I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, as Tim mentioned, my name is Karen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am wearing a light brown sleeveless shirt. I have light skin, and I have brown wavy hair. Um, as Tim mentioned, I am from Spectrix. We are a 360 degree ticketing, marketing and fundraising CRM solution. I've been here for about three and a half years. And prior to this, I actually worked at Capitol Theater in Yakima, Washington uh, with a lovely Charlie Robin, if any of you are familiar or know him. Um, I was patron services manager there for about two and a half years. Um, and so got a presenter's perspective, not necessarily of managing uncertainty at that time, we hadn't quite, uh, uh, hit the pandemic, but uh, I have seen quite a bit of organizations manage uncertainty, um, working with over 600 of them uh, here at Spectrix. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation and chatting with the folks here who are our lovely panelists. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jackie first to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jackie Lopez, but I'm also a hip hop practitioner and I'm also known as Miss Funk. I like to carry that name and carry that funky vibe anywhere possible. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, ella, um, and super excited to be here. I'm a Los Angeles native, so definitely paying homage to the Tomba land as well. And um, I am the co-founder and co-artistic director of Versa Style Dance Company, where we just celebrated our 17th year anniversary. So that is a huge ordeal as a hip hop dance organization. Um, but I'm also a lecturer. I teach at UCLA's dance department and I've been teaching there for 10 years and I've been building the hip hop and street dance curriculum with the mission to like just bring, you know, representation and diversity in ways that is desperately needed in these institutions. Um, that's a quick intro for me. I'll pass it on. Thanks, Jackie, and we'll turn it over to Tara. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tara Bailey, and I'm the founder of Bailiwick Booking Agency. We specialize in performing arts for all ages, as well as theater for young audiences. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm wearing a green dress, and I have light brown shoulder length hair. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the land in which I operate from, which is the Anishinaabe. Uh, we're just located about an hour north of Toronto, Canada. Uh, I currently sit on the board of both Nepalma and ASPA, which is the sister organization for agents and managers here in Canada. Um, I'm so excited to be returning to the in-person conference. So if you see me in Calgary, please come say hi. Thanks, Tara. And we'll turn it over to Stephen. 
Hi, I'm Stephen Cummins. I'm the Executive Director of Chico Performances at California State University, Chico. Uh, my pronouns are he, his. Um, we are on the ancestral lands, the unceded ancestral lands of the uh, Maidu people and the Machupta tribe. Um, I'm, like I said, the Executive Director of Chico Performances, a uh, university-based performing arts center. Um, been here for about nine years. Previous to that, I was at the Mackinac Arts Center in the uh, greater Chicago area. Awesome. Thank you all so much. We're excited to have you here and excited about this conversation. So as we have just heard, we have an artist's perspective, an agency's perspective, and a presenter's perspective in this conversation. And I just want to kick it off kind of on a broad level. Um, we've all just experienced the pandemic, are ongoingly experiencing the pandemic. Uh, but my first question is really kind of broadening that uncertainty. Is there other uncertainties or are there other uncertainties that you all are facing right now that you're talking about? Or is the pandemic still really top of mind? Um, I assume that there's others. I know we chatted a little bit about them uh, in, our, in our prep call, but I want to just hear, you know, make sure that people who are listening um, are understanding that this isn't necessarily just about prepping for the pandemic. We've, we've done a lot of that. We've done a lot of experiencing it. So what other uncertainties are there that you all are um, talking about most, most often right now at your respective organizations? Yeah. <clears throat> I could go first if you guys want, I guess. Uh, yeah, that, that question, you know, definitely speaks to me in many ways, because as a nonprofit hip hop dance organization, I feel we're on survival mode every day. And I just want to be frank, you know, like sustaining funding is like our own essence of pandemic in another way. Like, how could I go about making enough in uh, making enough to make ends meet to where our artists and the folks that are involved can make a living, especially living in Los Angeles. It's such a competitive market of industry and everything that we experience as a whole here in Hollywood. Um, you know, so I feel like I have been, I have witnessed, especially in the dance company spectrum, dancers coming in and out, you know, cause there's always another opportunity I've been very blessed where within Versa Style Dance Company, we've created a pipeline, which has been a way of shifting and pivoting, you know, to make things work, where when we meet these high school students, how can we give them the tools to keep moving forward and contribute beyond just the dance, you know? So now I'm at a point where a lot of those dancers are now the arts administrators and they help write the grants or they're the teaching artists where we go to different schools and teach. So I bring this up because I realize, like when we hire like within or when people are really invested within the mission, I feel the contribution and the focus or like the loyalty to the organization and its mission just feels much more authentic. Then from there, we're able together find a way to build ways to come up with like, you know, strategic plans on how to like survive in three years and five years from now? What funding pools are out there? What foundations, what gigs could we get? What partners could we have in order to keep moving forward? And I could even go a little deeper with partnership because that's taken a whole other meeting for me as a dance company. Everything I began as transactions because I just wanted to get a little in. There's no book on a hip hop dance company thriving and surviving in that sense. But now it's all about partnerships and really honing into the people, whether they're an executive director of a presenting company or an agent or uh, whatever it is, it's like coming to the person where they get to know us. Cause then eventually I hope we leave a mark where they're advocating and that advocation alone helps us survive and keep going. So um, I might get off God in a question. As you see, I get very passionate about my work, but it's such a livid experience, right? Like it's, something I'm living every day but yeah I think bottom line sustainability as a whole is like the issue always I don't think there's a line of people out there saying well I want a fun dance you know it, it's very rare so it's a con constant hustle and it takes away from my artistry because I'm still young and thriving I think I'm a pretty dope dancer still <laughs> and I love this art form and to talk about it but I'm constantly split in thinking of what I need to do to then, you know, make sure our organization is doing okay. 
So I'll stop there, but um, I could go in even in in specifics, but that's just something that speaks to me. And the pandemic was a whole other ordeal, right? I'm, I'm surprised we're here and I'm blessed. And I feel so just blessed right now that we're here and that I'm able to engage with you guys. And like Tara said, like to then be in person and meet everybody, I'm gonna be giving everybody hugs. I'm gonna be like, come here. Cause again, it's like these relationships are everything. So I'll stop right there. It sounds like the the idea of um, uncertainty isn't just one uncertainty versus another, it's survival. Um, does that ring true for you, Tara, Stephen, similarly? Yeah, I think just to jump in, um, it's about the viability of touring too. My One of my biggest concerns is the logistics and the viability of touring. I mean, so much of what we've done over the history is you know created these robust tours and you know without certain people being a part of the conversation especially for me with the educational component um, which I know Stephen really understands as well um, you know the logistics of touring and the viability of of you know the funding and and the concerns about you know, people canceling, all that just feeds into viability. Like, well, how do we, how do we continue to make robust tours for the artists and, um, you know, have a little bit of, you know, contingency leeway if something does go wrong? That's one of my biggest concerns. Stephen? Yeah, I, uh, uh, everything that you, that you both said um, rings, rings very, very true. Um, I think from the, the presenter side, um, you know, and, and I, I come from a, a unique part of California, not unique anymore, um, where wildfires were our other uncertainty. Um, you know, we've lost, we've lost parts of a season to wildfire um, um, in 2018-19. And um, and so you have all of these uncertainties and, uh, and the pandemic just um, laid bare where we were uh, most at risk um, in, our, in our operation, um, in our funding. And I've talked to um, some of my colleagues who um, honestly aren't as fortunate to be at a public university um, with the backstop of the state of California behind us. Um, you know, who had to lay off more staff than I had to lay off um, and things like that. And so I think that as we as we as we sort of move into this new era, um, you know, a lot of us are take, having to take a hard look at um, at our organizations mm -hmm. and say, what did we learn? And, you know, from the wildfire experiences, from the pandemic experiences, um, and how do we build a stronger, more resilient, sustainable, you know, sustainable Jackie organization to, to weather the next thing? And I think that's where we, where we, where some of us, you know, who obviously aren't here now, um, you know, we've got agencies and, and organizations and, um, and companies who um, didn't make it through. And so we have to learn from, you know, some of the mistakes, or I don't even want to say mistakes, some of the realities of some of our, our colleagues, um, and, and think about how we're going to diversify our revenue streams. How are we going to reassess what's at, uh, what it risk is? We, maybe we thought we knew, understood what risk was, but risk is maybe very different going forward. Um, and I think ja Jackie hit the nail on the head, Partnerships are more important than ever. It's it's actually one of my questions I wrote down, and I quoted you, Stephen, from our from our planning uh -oh. call. Um, <laughs> uh, what makes an organization stronger is its tentacles, is what he is the word he used, and and the partnerships that you create as an organization. Um, can can you all speak a bit more to how your organizational network has helped you through the pandemic or any other types of uncertainties, wildfires, anything like that? Just speak a little bit more broadly. Um, I think what would be helpful for folks on the call is even like, how did you get into an organizational network and start uh, building those relationships with other you know, partners, organizations that have helped you through? 
I don't know, Stephen, if that's a good one for you to start out with, since you just spoke. Uh, sure. So since since when I have the the tentacle metaphor, um, <laughs> you're like, did I say that actually? Well, I guess I did. You know, sometimes <laughs> it just rolls and and uh, you know, lack of filter. Um, but uh, it 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 really is, and I I would say it's it's on several levels in our community. It's um, uh, it's our donors. It's our corporate sponsors and partners. Um, it's all of those people who for some for some of them during the pandemic, we said, don't worry about us. We're going to be okay. Please, please, you know, continue to make your gifts. Also think about giving to the this dance company or or this, you know, local artist or this museum. Um, they may have not been on your radar screen before, but they need to be now. Again, because we had that, that um, we knew that we were going to be okay because we're part of the California State University system. Um, I say that knowing some other organizations in my same system didn't fare as well. Um, but we had, we had a president who, who stood behind us. Um, so that, and then it's WA, it's California presenters. It's APAP. Um, it's those organizations, um, um, and then some of those organizations in your community, Chamber of Commerce, the Downtown Business Chico Business Authority, and those kinds of things, where we just sort of said we're not we're not ever present in your mind right now because everybody's collectively. I mean, that was the thing that was so different about this than some other things. We all were in it at the same time, up you know, up to our eyebrows, and um, and so community meant very much a different thing to people. Um, when you you know suddenly going to the grocery store is a a big deal for everyone. Um, so um, that's that, those are where our tentacles are. I think it's different for um, for for arts uh, organizations, companies, Jackie. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it, it very much related yet different, right? Of course, to WA, uh, even during the pandemic, I would come to these conferences, whether it was online and I was so zoomed out and I didn't want to do it, but <laughs> all the need and the energy that I had to make to make that happen was, of course, a, a, a priority. Uh, but yeah, speaking, the partnership part is what I think really, I went a little deeper trying to make conference calls and like zoom meetings actually to get to know folks at a deeper level. I felt this is the opportunity. You know, I don't have to go somewhere. I'm not touring. I'm not performing. Like I can't even create work because we can't even be in the studio. Right. Everything shifted dramatically for us, but I think really capitalizing more on these meetings, these zoom meetings to get to know folks and even folks within the community who are very aligned and doing the same things that we're doing. So other dance companies, hey, what are you doing? What is up with you? And, and engage in conversations where literally I would bring my coffee and just know that I'm going to sit here for hours to like, just go deep, research, ask the questions, get vulnerable, get emotional, get happy, get all the emotions that go into running any organization. But I think I built just really some really, do, uh, really close relationships with individuals that I felt were experiencing the same thing, almost like our own leadership hub of folks that are experiencing the same thing and they're running dance companies and together, what can we maybe do or what ideas can you pass on? Relationships, partnerships is everything. I, I have never felt so much stronger about it till now, like till after the pandemic. I knew of it, it was that shift where even relationships with presenters. I mean, I have some real close relationships with a lot of folks here in California where it's like, what are you guys doing? And how could we work together and how could we figure something else than other than the life performance? Let us be your guinea pigs. We could do it. We are so innovative, especially as hip hop street dance practitioners who like come from the streets and come from this essence of resilience already. I thought we were always finding ways to innovate, create something new, create online content. And that's when I realized, oh, wow, our social, our social media went up, our youth, everything just took a whole other shift because that was the way, and then finding the folks that could help us make it better and get there. And there's always a lot of work. I don't think it ever, there's never an ending, you know, like we arrived, we're here, you know, especially as artists, but um, 
really just connect it with folks and you create that hub and you need it. I always, I have this thing, even when I teach class, like no, no one person can do it alone. It takes a village. And I'm just grateful to the village and the friendships and the partners that believe in our mission and vice versa. I have to be just as invested. It's not just a one-way thing. It has to be this, you know, uh, reciprocate in many ways. So it's been a lot of relationships with folks. Tara. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just writing some notes. Um, I would agree, it, you know, it's been membership organizations, you know, as a solo business owner, you feel often very alone, you, you know, without like a big support system. So some membership organizations really, you know, meant a lot to me. So, and we saw some membership organizations in my field that went away that didn't, that are not likely going to survive this, um, this change. Um, you know, WA, uh, Napama, um, the big one for, for me was the theater for, um, TYA USA is an organization that focuses on educational. They've created these affinity groups where the presenters that pr produce or promote, um, uh, present uh, theater for young audiences were working together. The producing houses were were meeting monthly um, and the agents that do what I do, uh, some on this call, shout out spring, uh, you know, we were able to meet once a month or for a while, maybe every couple of weeks just to talk about what we were all going through. And, you know, just having like my colleagues and, and being a part of this affinity group was huge and it's kept us going and we like are you getting this are you getting this like we are smarter together than we are alone right so um i think the, the membership organizations made me feel a little less uh isolated when we were all trying to isolate right so that's that's mine here i, I want to hear a little bit about some specific examples i'm just kind of curious if it, if any of you can share some specific examples that um you've been through that you've experienced where you faced uncertainty how did you how did you handle it did you feel prepared uh can anyone kick it off with with that i know we had a few examples stories shared in our earlier I could, call i could share one example that i felt proud of at the beginning as artists or as artists that want to stay active and keep performing and keep finding ways to still do what we do and maybe get some revenue, get some money out of it and keep going. Uh, it was our partnership with the Ford Amphitheater. Um, Cynthia is now the new executive director of the Ford Amphitheater and clearly no performances exist. And we got on the phone. First, I relate to her. I, think I was super inspired of the announcement that was made as a Latina, fellow Latina woman running something. I'm like, this is a girl that I need to get in touch with. And then finding ways to find how can Versa Style participate in whatever ways that the Ford is maybe shifting or adapting during the pandemic, as an example. And it was with her where we created our first like one hour show that was all online content. I didn't even know how to go about it. It took a lot of work, conversations where she's like, well, what's your show about? Well, this is what it's about. This is the experience we have. We also have some hands-on folks that could contribute in these ways, whether from videography and sound and music. And together we just created this like content, online content that I never even thought would be possible. We're so used to being live in person and then to be able to create something that was like an hour, something long, and then it aired. And then folks were able to like get in and not just be inspired by our stories and the show that we have created, but not, they were able to participate. I led like a class, a live class where everybody from the show goes to a Zoom meeting. And then I was like able to lead a, a dance class. It just built this community essence where again, I didn't feel alone. I was connected with folks virtually. And this whole virtual, that full virtual experience was like the set off for Versa Style Dance Company. Where I'm like, wait, if we could do that, how can we do now A, B, and C all virtually? If a presenter or a community organization or a school needs a curriculum, how could I bring it in this way, in this platform? And these conversations with the Ford Amphitheater, specifically with Cynthia, and then also involving my team, I, that shifted too. Though I'm the artistic director, we were really talking about like this essence of like, we're all artistic directors. We all got something to offer. 
what's your investment as a dancer, as a participant of Versus Style Dance Company? Let's all talk together. And I think the investment even within the company shifted. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me trying to just book anymore or make things happen and network. We're all networking. We're all talking. So um, those are like, like my vivid examples, as you can see, I get getting excited, but I'm so glad it's the past too, because I'm really excited about the in-person. So, but those were innovative ways as artists, those, that's a whole other mechanic, you know, to, to perform live, to then go and put something online and get in conversation with an executive director that has a vision too, and a mission for her at the theater. How could we coexist and make that happen? We laid the platform with other great LA dance companies. I'm not even taking all the credit, but together, then I felt like we're onto something new. That's a literal example that I could give one way that we made it work. Uh, can I piggyback on, on that? Because, um, you know, from the presenter side, uh, you know, we're, we're up here in, in mostly rural California and, uh, and we put out our, 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 um, what we call our, our children's youth, young audience field trip series, which normally brings, oh, you know, 20,000 kids annually um, in, into our theater who come from, you know, our county and, and maybe a couple touching counties. But we created that, that virtual series with some artists who, who wanted to, uh, um, who were able to, to put their work in, in into that medium and suddenly we're serving 10 11 12 counties in rural north in rural rural california and far north far north states so little the little town of weed um is is showing um you know um um sugar skull uh to to their to their um to their kids and and loving it and so we're getting all of this feedback there's the students are still sending us pictures that they've drawn, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, but it's, it was a, an entirely virtual experience. So the lesson learned is we're now a hybrid presenting yeah. series when it comes to, to our children's programming, because we, we can't leave our newfound folk four counties north of here. We, we need to pr keep providing them something. So now we need to figure out how to curate both an in-person series and a virtual series because in rural America, that's what they get. Yeah. So that was, a, that was just, um, you know, uh, an opportunity that presented itself. And now it's an opportunity that we need to, a need that we need to fill going forward. Um, so, you know, that's a, pos a positive thing. Another little positive thing we did that we need to continue doing is we, we have a local artist series and, and, um, and there was just, I, again, talk to sort of fall back on the business model. There's there, we found no good way as most of us did to monetize virtual. Um, so it, it's not, it's never going to replace a live audience. In, you know, in, in the dollars in the door. But we took that local artist series and created these great concert videos and then gave them the masters when it was all done. So, you know, we we created this wonderful product for, you know, our, our regional band and said, hey, and now you have, um, you know, a plug and play music video. Um, so, you know, these kinds of things kept us, um, you know, relevant in our community. They kept us able to support our artists, um, and put artists on our virtual stage. And so those kinds of things need to, need to continue going forward because they're still, they're important ways that we can serve our audience, our varied audiences. Yeah. I, I love how they, I'm so sorry. It, it spoke no, to me, the hybrid part, the hybrid series. It's so true. I think in many ways, we all could, we all adapted in that way. Mm -hmm. I'm taking that, Stephen. That's exactly what I was trying to say. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, but it's definitely very, it spoke to me in the way you you just put it out there. Because definitely there was, there was no revenue even in those virtual performances. But <laughs> yet, none, I know, you know, but boy, the who we were able to reach, you yeah. know. That was a whole other shift. And, 
And at the end of the day, that's a whole other conversation too. But besides from the, I mean, the pandemic where the reach and the folks that we want to continue reaching, I think it's made a lot of, they brought, they diversified that the audience too in a whole other way that never thought of theater. And now they're coming in to maybe check it out based on those experiences. Anyways, I, I'm just now in conversation. I feel like I'm in the room with you guys. <laughs> Tara, yeah. do you have do you have any examples from an agency's pr perspective? Well, I mean, just one of the ways we coped with, um, you know, uh, the whole situation we were all in is, you know, one of my artists just stayed out. We we went wherever um, anybody would have us, uh, you know, and that obviously um, having them be from the south, you know, it was it was Texas, it was Georgia, it was Florida, um, you know, even Kansas had us during the pandemic. Um, it was really fascinating, right? And this sort of leads into the conversation uh, that while we'll have tomorrow about polarization, like some of these communities, you know, were acted very differently from a, a, a lot of where we were coming from. Um, but having an artist that wants to keep on the road, wants to go out and, you know, and, and make it work was a, a big advantage for us. Um, and then the virtual element, um, for sure, it helped us keep some of these artists working. We're very fortunate in Canada because we have the Canada Council for the Arts. And at, when this sort of started happening, they reacted very quickly and created a digital uh, a fund. Uh, where artists could could apply to get funding to digitally adapt their performance for virtual. You know, it is a very different thing than watching like videotaping a live performance and, you know, directing a, a performance that's meant to be watched on the screen. Um, so that, I mean, we're very, you know, it's, it's Canada. We're lucky to have the Canada Council for the Arts. I give them much respect and uh, appreciation. Um, but yeah, so, you know, partly, you know, a, a match between virtual and, and staying out on the road. And I mean, not every performance will translate into virtual. I mean, one of my biggest companies performs in the dark. I mean, this is not, this is not extremely viable for a screen, um, but you know, this is, this is where we're at. So we did, we did everything we could. So, yeah, that's that's my two cents. In in all of these examples, it, it seems like like again the network that you have has been so crucial in you all being able to shift and adapt. I I also think back to your own people, um, and one of the things we talked about in our, in our prep call was the health and well being of um, of your people, and and how do we ensure that as we're planning for uncertainty, whatever that might be, how do we make sure our people are happy? Um, are there any lessons that you've all learned that have helped you to, you know, maintain staff to make sure that they're happy and um, and continuing to work with you? <laughs> the lessons we learned the hard way. <laughs> lessons, I mean, any lessons really, are helpful. <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll just jump in and say, you know, what we have to plan for now is, you know more understudies we have you know when we're creating work when the artists are creating work there has to be this you know backup plan that is that is you know put into the budget at the beginning right because trying to piece that together later when somebody's on tour and somebody gets sick that's not ideal we need these well i guess contingency but we need understudies for the work that we do at least uh, at least most of my performers do and that is something that we've learned uh the, the harder way yeah I think for me it was the personal check-ins um so we're even shifting as to we've had a lot of meetings and how to on how we want to move forward as a dance organization you know and this artistic director position or executive director position I even then I was able to vocalize I don't know if I'm too comfortable with this I don't know if I know more than you guys at this point you know I know my my gift is to make sure that it's the wellness of the organization, like the folks and listening to them. Um, I, I realized after the pandemic, we were going too fast, like any gig or anything that was coming is like, take, take, let's go, 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 go. It's when I was able to slow down and really engage in one-on-one -on -one meetings with each company member to check in on their 
their well-being, how they're doing mentally, emotionally, but also their their goals too. Because um, I always say versus style is not the it's not the ending. We're part of the process. We're part of the journey. You know. Um, so where do you stand? What do you want to do? What are your goals? I feel like those one on one meetings really really help me to just engage with them and make sure they're doing good. They're okay. And in what way we could be of service and vice versa. In what way could they be of service? Because I, I made it very clear. I'm human too. I don't have all the answers. I need you all to keep moving forward this machine, you know? So in that sense, um, I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I was listening more than ever. Um, and, and those conversations really just help navigate the organization in different ways where now we're having... Now from that, we have like these weekly meetings every week where we meet and talk. Hey, what are the updates this week? What do you guys want to talk about? What's going on? Where are we short? What do we want to do? Um, it's not just my vision. It's our vision. And I'm very proud of that with our company members. Um, and, and the turnaround in that sense, we've thought about that. Another thing I think Lee and I, Lee is also the other co-founder, core artistic director. Um, it's like, Will our dancers stick around? And what's going to happen if they don't? You know, how long is this touring going to happen? Uh, but we've just been blessed. I think our newest member, we've been around for 17 years. Our newest member dancing with us has been with us up to 12. We have dancers that have been with us for 15 years. So I know in that sense, I bring that up because we're doing something right. Like, again, we're a team. It's a team effort. I feel we're, we created like a family essence. And with that comes a lot of pros and cons because sometimes it gets a little too real and I'm like, whoa, fine line with therapy. I need therapy too. Uh, but again, it's, it's those deep conversations and me really taking in their ideas and being humble enough that I don't, that they got it better. Like the, the younger they are, they're thinking in different ways. I'm young still, but you know, if I'm working with a 25, 27 year old that's completely innovative about online contact or social media, I should probably be quiet and listen because <laughs> it could just take me, take the company and the organization in different places. But yeah, creating one-on-one -on -one meetings where we really checked in was everything. And also retreats. I'm just going to say that too. That was something new that came from the pandemic. I'm like, we need retreats. Well, how are we going to get the funding? Let's figure it out. <laughs> and where do we fundraise or what, you know, how do we diversify the, you know, our funding pool to even make that happen? Or what percentage could we take? And those retreats were very viable, like from, and leaving, make sure we left Los Angeles. We would go to like Big Bear or, or Palm Springs where we would check in in three days, four days we're together and come up with plans of what we want to talk about. It just got us closer. And I think also we all just ended up just really, there was like a momentum together. So these check-ins with folks, I think is essential. I think that goes for any, no matter where you're at. Business, yeah. it's, it goes everywhere. And um, I just want my folks to be heard because there's been many times I didn't feel that. And I want to do better as someone in the community. Yeah, we're not, we're not machines. We, we need that human connection, that personal touch. Stephen, I think you had brought this up actually in our earlier call. Do you have any additional insight you want to add? Well, I, I think we're... You know, as an organization, we're only as resilient as our people, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there were a lot of folks who were hurting in the last two years, and 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 you're at home, uh, seeing them, them only on Zoom, and um, and and without those check-ins, you're unaware. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'll say this to the leaders too. You got to take care of, there's a little self-care you need too, because you can, you can try to be lifting everything and, um, and, you know, and your Sisyphus rolling that stone up the, up the hill every day to just to push it back up the same landscape the next day. But you have to take some, some time for your, for yourselves or you will, be, or you will be no good to the organization, organization you're trying to lead. And, um, and I think, you know, lesson learned on my part is at there were days you know we're talking about partnerships and doing all this you know wonderful stuff but, but there were a lot of days where um we were in bunker mode you know we were just you know putting up the walls just trying to you know protect our 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 ourselves our our little organization we weren't able to think about our partnerships and the things not every day i mean i don't want to make this sound like Oh, we just did great. Did everything was perfect all year long. 
but no, it wasn't. There were days that were really, really hard for, for staff. And, um, and I really do think we need to, um, you know, lift, lift them up as much as we can. I, the other thing I will say about, you know, building a resilient organization is, you know, we're, we're going through the great, you know, resignation, reset, how, how, whatever you want to say, um, our organization has lost some people in, in some key roles because other opportunities presented themselves. They need more money and the arts aren't paying what, what, you know, what they would like to make. And so, um, you know, we really have to, as an organization say, how can we give the most we can give um, to our staff in salaries, in in well-being, in workplace, um, you know, just a culture that um, that supports them. So there's a lot of things, but you know, in the end, for some of them, it was really, you know, my family needs more money. And as much as we love your organization and have, you know, the last seven years we spent here. I need to move on. And so that is now that's, that's I, I, for us now, right now, that's the biggest challenge. That's the thing. That's, that was the uncertainty we, we didn't see coming again. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so we're out here in the marketplace looking for, looking for um, staff in some key roles. Um, and I look, I look at, I look at APAP jobs list. There's a lot of organizations out there right now are doing the same thing we're doing. So it's, it's a, uh, it might be a really good time to be um, a person with skills in the arts who's looking to uh, move up. Um, it might be a tough position if you're an org arts organization who can't shift and increase your payroll or your perks or something else. So that's a, I just got off of, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I pivoted there to, to, the, to the next uncertain challenges <laughs> taking care of our people and taking care of them so we can retain them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, don't go ahead, Jackie. No, that's big. That speaks to me because as a dance company, I mean, you guys, we didn't even get into salary stocks till um, we're around 17 years until like our 14th year. <laughs> like everything was like independent contractors. And that was a whole other conversation of, of sustainability for our artists. And I'll never forget that during the pandemic, it's when the AB5 law kicked in as well. <laughs> when Versus Style Dance Company decided, oh, we need to shift everything to payroll. And we literally did it in February of 2020. And then the pandemic hits in March. I yeah. thought, oh, this is the end. Wow, we have reached. All my resources were put into that to just make payroll happen. And I bring this up because there's a lot of artistic directors that just, you know, they have a gift to choreograph and, and direct and move and groove, but running a business is a whole other machine that I have to humbly admit it was all trial and error. And, and that AV5 law shifted it, but now I'm so grateful for it because now we're set up where if something else comes up, some of the dancers, if they need to go on an employment, I'm not stressing. Like these are like real things that it feels like business 101. But it is because as artists, we just want to dance and create so to run a business and then be able to then keep these artists and talk about salaries and hire HR or go to these conferences to learn all the stuff. Uh, it was the biggest shift in, in versus style. Uh, God, and I don't, you know, it's, it's just difficult to this day. It's always going to be difficult because I want to take care of everyone, like he, he said. Mm -hmm. And my dancers now are in their late 20s. I'm seeing like some. Some of my folks are talking about proposal, maybe kids now. I'm like, those things change the dynamics of everything. But luckily, also, we have to think of day at a time. You know, I have to like, if I focus too much on that, since um, it could stress the heck out of me. So I just thought I'd bring that up because those are like little logistics that a dance company, there's no book on how to like run a dance company, be art artists, but also run the business of a nonprofit you know, and then managing all the personalities. There's such a thing for me now. My resume is like personality management and folks <laughs> like from the board to the company members, to the donors, to the partnerships. Wow. I think that's why I give hugs, but um, yeah, that just really <laughs> spoke to me, uh, Stephen, everything you just said, because that's real. It's super real. And um, 
yeah I'll stop <laughs> well I love hugs so <laughs> that's great <laughs> Um, we are opening it up to folks who are on the call. So if you are listening and you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we can be sure to ask those. Um, but as folks are maybe thinking of those, I, you know, I just grasped onto one of the things you just said, Jackie, is you went through a lot of trial and error. And it seems like facing uncertainty is quite frankly that it's trial and error. But if there was one thing that you all feel, you know, stood out to you in your past uncertainties that you faced that help you or will help you moving forward? Is there any like one big thing that you would give as advice to organizations or, or folks who are listening today um, to be resilient? Is it is it those networks and partnerships? Is it, you know, changing a force majeure clause in your contract? What are, what are those kind of big topic things that you would suggest to take a look at or, or really hone in on to be I think, agile? I think yeah, I think for me, it was stay the course, just mm -hmm. stay the course. This is this is good work that we're doing. Um, this is the work that I, I am passionate about. Um, that was the big thing for me. Just, you know, let's get through this, stay the course. Let's keep connecting with our artists, our presenters, um, and just keep moving in a forward motion. And that's what's got me through it somehow. I mean, I was a very, very young company when this whole thing started. Um, I started my company in 2018. So 2019 and 2020 were my first, was my first season. So I, I got three quarters of the way through it into March and, you know, everything got shut down and I was just determined to, 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 to keep going. Um, and I'm very honored and lucky to have great artists to work with. So um, for me, it was just, you know, stay focused and, and, and we'll get through it. Yeah, definitely stay focused, but also be flexible. Like sure. Flexible, yeah. right? Like for us, like adapt to any change. I think every year there's going to be something right now we're dealing with inflation. <laughs> yeah. Which is a whole other ordeal. I don't have a home base. So we ran out of studios and now I'm like, competing like where do we go because every dime matters but I think at the end of the day flexibility you know what what incidents or situations happen where then we as a team need to look at our contracts too and shift that right away you know what you know whatever that is it's just I realize it's just being as flexible as possible for uh to adapt and be with the times as well no matter what the situation um, yeah, that was the biggest learning curve for me. Like uh, sometimes I'm set in my ways and this should work, or this is how it's always happened. And I'm like, oh, wow, definitely flexibility and being open to these scenarios to adjust and shift and rewrite and do the work. And then another thing for me, I think from saying the course to uh, this focus in the next generation, uh, we have this young group called Versus Style Next Generation and like giving them all these tools that I feel are necessary and I think I brought this early to like hire within and then they could then become the administrators, the grant writers, the folks that are like talking to our donors, running our platforms online. Um, I feel that there's been a lot of success in that and versus just going out and not knowing the folks and then bringing them in versus really watering the folks that you're working with and getting to know them and giving real opportunities to then maybe grow into something else. But yeah. That's me. I'd say flexibility comes with a lot of compromise. And given that we have ah. folks representing different areas of the industry, I'm just curious if, if you know, there are any examples of compromise that you've had to make in terms of facing uncertainty to, to kind of stay that course or, or be flexible or one or the other. Um, I, I mean, in, in all, of, well, this sort of goes to Cheryl's question that I saw in the Q and a about what, what the precautions and things are. So, um, you know, there were areas where you can compromise and there are areas that you can. not And so, um, when a company would come in and we'd say, here's our COVID policy. And they're like, well, we're, we're here. Okay, you're, we're here. Where are we going to meet? And I can't compromise on this piece. I'm, 
because when you come in here, you're you're in the state of California, and I and I gotta I gotta follow those rules. And so we we would you know you would find those those areas of compromise. Um, what's very telling is when some people won't compromise. And um, and I was I was on I was on uh, a call with uh, two other um, presenters, and we were bitching a little um, about some 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 in certain markets, some real artist inflation that we're seeing and unwillingness on that agent's side to sort of, can we, can we just say that inflation is 8% and you can raise that fee to 8% or 10% of what it was in 2018? That seems reasonable, but 40% is just a little, and you know, and and then it just comes down to the end of, if you can meet me somewhere on that fee, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly willing to increase it from what it was you know, pre-pandemic, because I know what we've all been through. But I have my limit too, that my audience can, can afford to, to pay a ticket at the, to see. So there's, I, I feel like there's, with some people, it's like, yes, we we both want the same thing. Let's find where where we want to go, and and you know, and then that's how you choose who in the end you're going to work with in this business is who's, um, who who treat you know who treats you with with respect and listens to your point of view and helps come to that middle ground sometimes and other times they say that's just a place I can't move. Mm -hmm. I, Great. And 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 just to to recap, I, I don't know if everyone saw the question, and I apologize, Cheryl, for being a little late to it. But um, Stephen did mention that that it did relate to this. But Cheryl's question was: Moving into this presenting season, what level of precautions are being required by artists to perform your experiences? For example, masking, COVID testing. Um, can anybody here speak to what they've seen um, or what they are seeing for this upcoming presenting season? For that regard. I'll just say that everybody's comfort levels are very different across the country, right? As somebody that works with, you know, people in New York, Texas, and California, everybody's comfort levels are so different. Um, you know, for us, uh, my artists have been as amendable as possible for their, for in regards to COVID restrictions, mask all the time. In fact, my one artist performed in masks before COVID, okay, because it's part of their blackout, you know, sort of, you know, under, um, you know, the, 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 the puppeteer in the costume. Uh, so that, that was a non-issue for some of us, but I just, I would like to say everybody's comfort levels is different. And I think as long as, you know, we speak to um, individual communities and how, how they want to, and just let people, you know, follow the mandates and let people mask if they feel uncomfortable. I mean, that's just, that's the biggest thing. I just wanted to hit on the point that um, Jackie made about inflation and, and you did too, Stephen, uh, about re renegotiating fees. Um, I just want to say really quickly, the one, I mean, we all know about the gas, you know, everybody's been listening to the gas. Okay. It's the hotels that are really messing with some of the touring artists. Mm. The hotel fees have gone up, you know, a good third, you know, 20 to 30%. And we're not seeing those fees come down now that people are getting back out there. So what's, what's going on with that? We don't know, but I just want to point that out is it's not just gas when, when it comes to inflation or groceries and whatnot, it's these hotel fees, you know, and, and it's so lovely because so many of these presenters provide hotels for us and we are so great, you know, appreciative, but there are the days that in which we have to travel. California is a big state, you know, <laughs> the West is very spread out. So um, just keep that in mind, you know, when you're thinking about inflation, the, it's the hotel costs that are really like, really yeah. messing with our, our tour budgets. So um, thanks. Thank you for adding that because I think it's it's an important note that I think a lot of people don't even think about because gas is so prevalent um, and flights. Yeah, thank you. And flights. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got about you know four minutes or so left, and and so I do want to wrap this up. And this has been an amazing conversation. 
Um, I, I sent this to, to all you three before this call, but I was just kind of curious if any of you have a question for one another that you'd be keen on asking um, with regard to how each other plans for uncertainty or, or even just a comment or something to consider like flight prices and hotel costs and things like that. Um, does anybody have a, kind of a burning question they wanna ask one another? Um, my question was, why would you cancel a gig? like Steven and um, Jackie, do you guys have, why would you cancel a, a performance? Cause I'm gonna tell you that, you know, the one company I work with has never canceled. And it's just been interesting because we have the understudies, we have the resources to put other people in there. Why would you two cancel a show? Other than official mandates. I I don't think we've ever canceled a show, so I don't know if it relates to me so much. I mean, there was once I recall that, and it sticks to me because I think 80% of our company ended up getting COVID. So I had no choice. <laughs> yeah. you know, I was like, it, it hit us. We were all safe. And somehow, you know, you know how that happens. One person gets it. We were all sick. But so we had no choice but to cancel. And God did work it around because I feel Versa has a reputation like professional I feel people always have this essence of what hip-hop and street dance may look or have their preconceptions unfortunately still till this day um it's all about professionally for being professional being on time being friendly being there 100 percent but I wouldn't yeah I don't think it pertains so much other than when COVID really shifted things maybe this applies more to Stephen maybe I don't know um I I really can't say because uh, pre-pandemic uh, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I, we exercised our force majeure clause at one place I worked and that's the only time. And that was because there was a power outage. And then we rescheduled the artist. The artist was willing to stay over. It was, a, it was, we had three shows of stomp 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, we didn't have electricity. We canceled um, one show and then rebooked it. Um, and that's the other thing that I think we tried to do during the pandemic is for those for the season that we lost or the por portion of the seasons we lost we any artist that was willing to rebook with us we did and i think that was just that needed to be our commitment to that artist who was willing to come here in the first first place that we want you back here um, and so any artist in fact this season this upcoming season, we have the one artist that we couldn't get in last year's season um, coming. So we've honored every every contract where an artist wanted to rebook. Um, so honestly, uh, you know, the government told us to close our doors. We closed our doors, and as soon as they said we you could open them back up, we opened them back up. Um, you know. I will say, I know I have colleagues in, in the, more, the more commercial world who make financial decisions to cancel shows. Um, but we, you know, we have the luxury of not having to do that. So we know we'll take a loss on a show, but that's okay. We'll make it up somewhere else through fundraising or um, you know, beer and wine sales or whatever. So anyway, so... I don't, we don't cancel shows. And, Thank and you. Most, most of our folks in California presenters don't cancel shows. Yay. Thank you for rebooking too. You bet. Jackie, Stephen, did you have any questions that you thought of that you were hoping to ask, you know, Tara, Stephen, Jackie, any one of you? Believe it or not, no, I'll be honest. I, I just came to be as present as possible. And I, if anything, I'm just glad I got to be in conversation with everyone. You know, um, I'm, I'm good. It was great. And I hope people could walk away with something, you know. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, yeah thank yes. you. Thanks, Karen. Of course. Um, if there's any other folks who want to ask any questions, um, we can pop those in the chat now. Otherwise, we can wrap in the next couple of minutes. Um, Tim, I don't know if I should be handing it over to you. <laughs> oh, thank you all. That was great. I really appreciate you sharing all of this. And um, I, I think I don't see any more la last minute questions. So just want to say thank you again for a wonderful conversation. And, uh, we will hope to see you all in Calgary. And thanks to everybody online.
Thank you, Tim. Thanks. Right. Thanks to Wa. All right. See you soon. Take care. Thank right. you. There's one question for you, Karen. It looks by like the way. The <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> we'll pop my email in there. If in there <laughs> well, it was nice to be in conversation with all of you. Tara, it was nice to meet you, Stephen. Yes. Are you, Stephen, are you going to be at the conference? Uh, my, that's my hope. Ah, okay. I, I heard it's my home. I'm like, oh, wait. But Jackie, we need, we need to get you to North, Northern California up here. Yes. That'd be yeah. great. Actually, in November, Stephen, we're going to be in Luther Burbank and in Humboldt and in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I, I should give you some dates. We'll be in touch. All right. Do you have an agent, you have an agent Jackie? No, I'm just kidding. We do. You know what? After Good. 17 years, I decided to finally take on an agent. It just Good. happened with Pinnacle. Great. Like, Congratulations. I was with Sandy. Just, no, I'm thank you. I was kind of joking, but that was no, but it's true. That was a big, that was a big conversation for me. Like, I'm like, do I want to keep doing this work? It's a lot. So I'm a little nervous. I, I'm not, not going to lie. You know, I've never handed the booking to someone else because are they going to speak about my work as passionately in me as I do, you know, but <laughs> have they, have they seen your work have yes, they in, in person? That's the, that's the fundamental thing for me is I need to see the work. I can't sell it. I can't sell it if I, if, if, you know, and I, and I don't want to take it if I'm not passionate about it. But yeah, well, I hope to, I think I'll see you, Tara. Karen, are you going to be at WA? I will be at WA next week. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting you all in person. It'll be yes. great. Please come to, <laughs> come to the jury showcase or spread the word because we, we got yes. the jury showcase spot on Tuesday night. So awesome. cool. great. Yeah. Amazing. You guys take care. Okay. Bye, Thank guys. you so much, Bye. everyone, for the great conversation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Machiavelli. You take care too. I know you're there handling all these people. So. <laughs> Bye. Bye.